All right, let's get. See, we'll go ahead and jump in. Hearing some good stories. Anybody want to share a famous person? Maybe they've met. Like, uh, no. I have too many. You have too many. Ooh, met Samwise. That's yep. that's the way to go. That's good. Yeah. Jeanette, did you meet someone famous besides me? <laughs> well done. That's legit. That's legit. Right. Yeah. It's pretty good. Ray. We were at we were at Six Flags. We saw May and Bilek, you know, Blossom. Oh, yeah. Poor she, yeah. DJ. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Legit. Very good. We met uh, Comic Con. We met Peter, Peter Mayhew. Chewbacca. Such a, Such a nice guy, guy, dude. Chewbacca so good. Oh, it's <laughs> pretty good. That's pretty good. Nick? Nick? Chuck Norris, but Bro. He just shook his hand, took a picture, and was like, next. Next. <laughs> it's not the same. To me. All four members of Switchfoot. Pretty good. So we met. So. There you go, all over pizza. We had uh, we we we've had a few opportunities. We've met Ashley Eckstein, voice of Clone Wars. We met that, and then years ago, years ago, my dad ran restaurants, and he was in uh, and he was in a hotel, and the hotel was just outside uh, the old Jack Murphy Stadium, and so sometimes, you know, players that were in between would come up, and they 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 they'd stay, they put him up the hotel because it was like one exit away, and so my dad introduced me to this guy that came in. Uh, he was a converted shortstop because every player of the Padres is a converted shortstop. And uh, he was pitching. And he's like, yeah, this guy just came in, just got traded to us, and, and uh, he's new. So I'm like, that's great, man. It's nice to meet you, and uh, good luck. Da, 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 da. He's like, yeah, his, dad, his brother works, or his dad works with the Dodgers, and he's with us. I'm like, hey, man, welcome to San Diego. So when he left, because my dad has absolute great mojo, got this guy to sign a mitt. And it was years later, as I'm in my dad's office, and I find this mitt, that said, to Joe, Thanks for everything, Trevor Hoffman. Wow. So I knew him before. So that's cool. Anyway, anyway, so but meeting famous people is fun. You know, hey, what is that? Famous people, they're just like us. The, uh, except unless, of course, you're the king or queen of England, in which case they're not like us. Did you know that if you ever get a chance to go and you get to meet uh, royalty, you get to go meet the, the king or queen of England, there's actually a few rules you should follow. It's not a lot. It's not like a lot of written rules, but you know, men you're supposed to give a you know, neck bow. Women, curtsy. You're supposed to be polite. You would of course refer to the king or queen as your Majesty, and then affectionately, ma'am or sir. After that, you've got to give them their their due. Um, there's also a number of unwritten rules apparently, because it's the British, and as 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 and, and traditions and protocols that people who care about that stuff actually pay attention to. So. The British way is a little bit different than the American way of doing things, and there's a bit more pomp with the royals, a sense of being elevated above all others. In fact, the, the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II, was, she, was, she reigned in England for 70 years, which is impressive. There are people alive in England who didn't know any other monarch than her, and, and she had met every president other than Lyndon Johnson in that 70 years. So occasionally... Occasionally, though, of course, because you have heads of state coming together, there's interactions that would always you know, cause a scandal or cause a stir, uh, making people wonder if respect had been shown. Uh, there's a story of Jackie Kennedy causing some tension when some of the people that she invited to the state dinner in England were not up to, were not up to the Queen's standards, we'll just say. And there was a little bit of, uh, of bumping, bumping heads. Um, the Queen apparently in her younger days held a little bit of a grudge, it turns out. Uh, Actually, the queen got so frustrated that they had to have diplomats step in and help smooth things over. Uh, Michelle Obama actually uh, put her arm around the queen, which is apparently a big no-no. You don't put your arm around it. just came up and gave her a side hug, which is kind of awkward. Not supposed to touch the queen. Uh, supposedly, Donald Trump decided to, on a handshake rather than a bow, and apparently he walked in front of the queen. Oh. 
which is kind of a big no-no as well. Um, it's, this picture may be out of context. I don't know, but it is what it is. Uh, there's even, though, but there's even a tradition, get this, there's even a tradition that in the presence of the queen, you don't wear sunglasses, and yet, here we are. And, but perhaps, oh yes, but perhaps, here's the, big, here's the strangest one. Okay, 1977, when Jimmy Carter was president, here's the story. He's a good southern boy. He was meeting with the queen, and he's meeting with the queen mother. So there you have the queen, you have the queen mother, okay? And at the end of the evening, uh, according to him, at the end of the evening, he kissed the queen mother, in his words, lightly on the cheek. Good southern boy. But according to her, she said, he is the only man since my dear husband died to have the effrontery to kiss me on the lips, is what she told the biographer. So the scandal is that Jimmy Carter kissed the queen mother on the lips, and she says, uh, she, she recalled how she took a sharp step backwards, but not quite far enough, that's what she said. So just when you're in royalty, don't lean in for a kiss. Just don't, just don't do it. So now I have, to, I have to admit, I think any of us, if we're aware of it, would be kind of nervous or awkward if we had the chance to meet the king or even the president, right? You, we, imagine if you find yourself face to face with them, we'd be a lot more, we'd be a lot more self-aware of ourselves, you know? Maybe you've done that if you meet a famous person, you know, our clothes to our breath, to the, to the words we speak. I was in an elevator one time and at a conference, and I ran into a, a member of a band, and I, and I was like, oh, it's that guy. He's the guy from the band, and he's awesome, and I want to ask him a question, and it, it was like the stupid, so how do you like uh, playing guitar? I was like, <laughs> where did that come from? Okay, and just awkward, you know, so I would imagine, because we know we could possibly make a very terrible impression by saying the wrong thing, right? We might even be humbled, we might be humbled to be in their presence, to be like, oh, I'm with the queen, oh, I get to meet the president, you know, and that's, that, maybe someday that'll happen, but what if, what would it look like for us then to be face-to-face with, with God? What if we found ourselves in his presence? What would that be like? Because like the king, King Charles would be one thing, right? Great, but the king of kings is, is, is quite another. In fact, I had a professor in college who would tell us all the time, he says, the president of the United States walks through that door today, we would all stand. But if Jesus walks through that door we're all going to get on our knees. I thought that's a good way to look at it. Now, it's kind of hard to imagine that, but that is exactly the situation that the prophet Isaiah found himself at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 6. This is a beautiful passage. It's about Isaiah's call to ministry. This happens in the year about 740 B.C. The kingdom of Israel is divided between Israel and Judah. And at that time, a guy named Uzziah is reigning in the southern kingdom of, 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 of Jerusalem. And Jude. And so Isaiah is given a vision of the Lord. And he finds himself in this vision in God's throne room. And this is what he says. He says, in, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe, okay, the length of his robe, filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, which are these angels. And it says, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. They're calling back and forth to each other. So imagine the scene. It's the throne room of God. The length of God's robe is filling this temple. It's incredible. And in this, and in this magnificent room are these six, six-winged angels flying around, calling back and forth to each other about the, about the holiness of God. And you know, sometimes you see these pictures of biblical angels, and they're kind of weird. I liked this one because I thought it, it captured it, right? Six wings covering their face, covering their feet, flying. And, and, and here it is, you know, the, the seraphim in Scripture, there's this mighty class of angels that serve in the Lord's presence. And even they will not look at God. They cover their face with one set of wings. They cover their feet, which is a, a symbol of humility, and that where they are is a sanctified and holy place. There's nothing like them on earth, and I'm sure if you saw them, their presence would be pretty terrifying, right? I mean, even if they look like humans and people have all these different opinions, to see them winged and covered and glorious, that'd be a trip, okay? And Isaiah goes on. I mean, you kind of have this, this scene, like just the splendor of where he is. There's the angels, there's the presence of God, his robe coming down and filling the temple. And he says, the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, 
For I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And he says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, in his hand a burning coal, which is, think about that, uh, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Isaiah, at that moment, as many of us would, realized he is in way over his head, right? He's humbled, he's broken down. He saw not only the magnificence of God, he also saw his own insignificance, right? How, how, how much he fell short. He became totally self-aware of himself, how he didn't compare to God. And he knew, as the Bible says, that those who see God would surely die. That's what the Bible says. In fact, Scripture records Moses said this. He said, please show me your glory. He's having this interaction with God on Mount Sinai. He said, Lord, show me your glory. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I will be gracious to you, whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you can't see my face and live. For a man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by, and then I will take away my hand, but you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Imagine the glory of God that you just you know, fall over and die, right? It's this belief and this idea that in the presence of God, just to bear his holiness, you know, we can't even imagine that. And Isaiah surely knows this verse, and he finds himself on his, on his knees. And, and I want you to imagine yourself in this scenario for a minute, right? You are face to face with God. And I'm going to be honest, I'm excited someday to see Jesus. Like that's the goal, right? That's the hope. That's the desire to see Jesus. And I know my sins are paid for, okay? I'm not going to go see my judge. I'm going to go see my heavenly father. And that's going to be an exciting time. But to be in the throne room of God, surrounded by his singing angels, it just might be a little bit too much. And I don't think I'd have to worry about what I would say because I would probably be speechless, right? Just, you know, absolutely my head down. The thing is, we don't have to be in the throne room of God to come to grips with the majesty and the sovereignty and the glory of God. He reveals it all the time. I mean, Moses only saw uh, the back of God's glory. You don't have to see the face of God. Just to see, like, you get to see my back. You get to see the back of my hand. Even that little bit will fundamentally change a person. It changed Moses. The Bible says when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. Dude's face was gl- literally glowing because he'd been in the presence of God. It tripped everybody out. He put like a hood with a curtain on his face. Because can you imagine that? Wow, you're really shiny today. That's like, boo. and so that was just being changed by God. And so when we experience God, when you and I, when we experience God through his word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his character revealed in nature, we will be fundamentally changed. We will be transformed. And the presence of God in our life is a very real thing because we have the Holy Spirit in our life. And so we cannot gaze into the truth of who God is without being transformed, without being changed, without having some fundamental difference happen in our life. You can't experience God and walk away from that and go... That's cool. I mean, think about the life-changing experiences that you've had in your life. That could be a joyful experience. It could be a traumatic experience. There's some point in your life that everything is kind of before and after that moment. And for Isaiah, it's this face-to-face time with God. And maybe for some of you, it was a diagnosis. Maybe for some of you, it was a death. Maybe for some of you, it was a, you know, meeting the person of your dreams. Whatever it is, there's a moment where everything before and everything after this point are completely different. And so when we understand and have met with God, we can't gaze into the truth of God without being transformed. We will be different. And what's cool about this passage is transformative it is in Isaiah's life. It gives us some takeaways of what it means for us to be face-to-face with God and how it changes us and how, it, how we should respond. So we're going to look at those real quick today. And so first off, we're face-to-face with God. It is an opportunity for worship. We get to worship God. It says the angels are constantly in God's presence and are constantly praising God. The Bible says they are proclaiming, the Bible says, proclaiming God's holiness. And that's exactly what we do when we worship, right? We're ascribing worth to God. We are declaring the realities of God, his character, his power, the truth of who he is. 
I like Psalm 18.3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. God is worth it. There's a lot of things in this world that aren't worthy of being praised. A lot of people who demand worship or demand, hey, pay attention to me. And the reality is, it's like, you're not worth it, but God is worth it, and that's why we worship him. And Revelation 5.11 shows the, this future scene around the throne. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders of the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the sun, earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever, right? And so when we enter the presence of God, worship, that bended knee, always needs to be our first response. And sometimes that is just awestruck silence. Sometimes it's praising God, saying, worthy are you, Lord. Sometimes when you have a good day, we worship God. Sometimes we have a bad day, but we feel God's peace in our, his presence. What do we do? We, we worship God. So that's the first thing we do. If we're going to be face-to-face with God, we're going to interact with God, meet him, we need to worship God. The second thing, though, being face-to-face with God is an opportunity for repentance. Well, Isaiah said this, he says, Woe is me, <laughs> woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And this idea of our unclean lips, that's not really something we go around talking about. I am, my lips are unclean. Is, it's this idea that if the lips are unclean, the whole person is unclean. Right? It represents what goes in and what comes out of us. And in the presence of God, that which was unholy about Isaiah and, and, and God's people as a whole was revealed in stark contrast to this clear and declared holiness of God. Like The closer he got to God, the more he's like, wow, I'm not dressed for the occasion at all. So anyone who's ever tried on clothing in store knows that what lighting makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Right? Ladies, putting on your makeup in the morning, mm-hmm. right? The light matters, okay? And uh, harsh light versus soft light, direct versus indirect light. Even now, the, like the, I, this is how I know I'm old. I have an opinion on the temperature color of a light bulb. Oh, it's 5,000. They're too bright. <laughs> you know, old man, whatever. <laughs> but you do, you know. You just have, you, you, you notice a difference, right? Even the lights you use in your bathroom, they can be encouraging and flattering. Well, I look good today. Or discouraging because... Some don't give off a true light. Or that harsh fluorescent lighting that makes you look sick and pale. And then you have this warm light that makes you look healthy. And, of course, everyone looks great in the dark where you can't see your flaws, right? Or, you know, we, I was taking pictures the other day at the beach, and you've got the golden hour. Right? You know, I see people run outside to take pictures. No, the light's perfect. You know, and, and that's true. Photographers know it. Photographers know how important lighting is. You know, when JT and I were shooting those videos over, you know, we're like, we got to get these lights right. And we're trying different things. And, you know, we're just, it's got to look good, you know, whatever. And like, no, don't use that light. It looked terrible, you know. And we do whatever we can to do that. But imagine now a light that reveals everything, where nothing is hidden, everything is exposed, every flaw, every mistake, everything we try to hide that makes us uncomfortable about ourselves or that we hope never gets revealed is seen in that light. And this is the light of the presence of God. Or as Paul describes it to Timothy, he calls it the unapproachable light where God dwells, where, who no one has ever seen or can see. This light that shines on everything, through everything, exposes everything. Daniel describes God as the one who reveals deep and hidden things, and he knows uh, what is in the darkness, and the light dwells within him. The Bible talks about how the day is coming when all things will be exposed and all things will be, whatever is hidden will be uncovered. And once things are exposed, there is no point in hiding them anymore. Once things have been exposed, there's no point in hiding anymore. And the only person we're fooling at that point is what? It's ourselves. It's ourselves. And all we do, can do is, like Isaiah did, is confess that we are unclean. Now nobody likes that. Nobody likes the fact that the mirror never lies. No one likes to see things in that light and goes, wow, that's got to work on that. We don't like that. I get it. But the funny thing that is, is that the secret to biblical 
cleanliness and holiness begins with the acknowledgement that we're filthy. It starts with this acknowledgement that we are unclean people. And Jesus tells, it's one of my favorite stories, he tells a story of two men who stood in the temple of God in Jerusalem praying. And he said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, <laughs> or even like this guy, this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. Good job. Wow. The tax collector, standing far off, he wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, beat his breast saying, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus then says, I tell you, this man, this tax collector, went down to his house justified, declared righteous, rather than the other. Why? Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. See, being face-to-face with God is this great opportunity to come clean and repent of our sin, to acknowledge who God is and who we are not, right? Remember a pastor years ago talking about standing in front of the mirror, and every morning he would shave, he would just remind himself, God is God, and I am not. That's a great way to start your day, okay? Looking at that mirror and say, God is God, I am not. Let's start with that. The beautiful thing, though, is about this light that exposes us, that, that shows us who we are and kind of shows us where we fall short. It's also the same light that offers hope. And so I don't want you to just hear the first part. You have to hear the second part because being face-to-face with God is an opportunity for forgiveness. And this is awesome. <coughs> this is one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand that burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and he said, Behold... This is touch your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And this coal that was taken by the angel was a symbol of God's atoning and purifying work. By touching the lips of Isaiah, he was symbolizing that his repentance had brought healing. It brought forgiveness. And as you can imagine, however, this idea of a live coal on our lips, that would probably be pretty painful. See, I know the angel's holding his hand, but I don't think that this visceral experience that, that Isaiah had was anything short of just very realistic in his, in his mind. And, and I think he felt everything. And as MacArthur, John MacArthur says this, he says, repentance is painful. Repentance is painful. And I think we would all agree to that truth. To confess is hard. To admit where we fall short is difficult. And this process that God takes us to can be difficult. But here's the point. Repentance and forgiveness go hand in hand. And being honest with God and with ourselves about our sin, we are giving God now the opportunity to forgive us, to apply his atonement to our lives. His divine grace is the solution to our depraved humanity. Let me say that again. His divine grace is the solution to our depraved humanity. As Paul says in Romans, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And so God wants to forgive us, but we have the responsibility to repent. Those two things go hand in hand. Okay? We have to say we're sorry. And that's the same truth presented in 1 John. This is the message, he says, that you have heard from him, and and we proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie, we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. And I grew up saying this next verse. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that funny? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's wild to me, right? It's only by admitting we're broken that we have healing. And, and there's one more lesson from this, something else Isaiah teaches us, that God, look, God didn't reveal heaven's wonders to Isaiah just for the likes. Hey, post this, it's going to be awesome, okay? He didn't need to bring him to the throne room of God to reveal his glory to Isaiah, to, or, or reveal Isaiah's ugliness. There was no need for the burning coal when God's people were still sacrificing bulls and goats. The truth is, God had something special planned for Isaiah, And Isaiah's confession and God's cleansing were because God was preparing Isaiah to be his prophet. And look at this. You need to know this, that God's cleansing is the beginning of God's commission. All right? God's cleansing in our lives is the beginning of God's commission, God's plan, and God's work for our life. And so being face-to-face with God is an opportunity for service. 
Isaiah says this, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Now we come face to face with God, worshiping and repenting and receiving his graceful forgiveness. The next question is, now what? Now what? What do I do with this, Lord? What, what is my response to this encounter? And really, that's it. There's only one thing left to do, which is dedicate ourselves to the service of God. And that's the order as you read scripture. That's the order of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of your works, lest anyone should boast. And then he says in 2.10, For we are his workmanship. Why? Created in Christ Jesus. What? For good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? We are fundamentally changed by this encounter with God and that everything we do after that can only be a response to this encounter, the before Christ and after Christ, right? Second Corinthians says this, he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Right? It's not my life anymore, it's God's life. And so the, authentic, the authenticity of a face-to-face encounter with God will be revealed by this changed life. And these verses tell us that we're saved to serve, and then when God calls us, we really have no other choice than just to say, here I am, Lord, send me. And you know what? You know, what? You know what's fun about this? God didn't say where we were going. He just said, who's going to go for us? And he's like, I'll go. Where are we going? And, and he really surrendering to God is saying, let me, let me just sign the document, Lord. Fill in the, fill in the details. Now, yesterday... Yesterday, we, we, we had the, the, the fun experience of buying a car. Woohoo! And uh, on it, there's this place on there where you sign like a full contract. And they said, by law, you sign it, and they sign it, and they prove that they can't add anything after you sign it, right? So you've signed it. So you, there's no blank spaces where they can like throw in some charge or some weird thing that you didn't ask for. You're protected by this contract. With God, though, it's the opposite. With God, we sign that, believing God to do what's best for us. Say, Lord, it's blank. Fill it in. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Where are we going? And that's a step of faith. I get it. But that's something that we need to do because by serving God without, you know, that that we have have no other choice but to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. You've taken care of my heart. You've transformed my life. What do you want? Let's go. But listen to this. But serving God without first worshiping God and humbling ourselves and letting him transform us, without doing those things first, that's hollow and empty. And I don't have this in your notes, but you can write it down. God wants our hearts, our whole hearts, before he gets our hands and feet. Okay? God wants our whole heart before he gets our hands and feet. Because you can be busy for the Lord without having a relationship with God. That's the Pharisees. But when God has your heart, he gets everything else too. So what? Simple. Simple truth. Encountering God must change our life. Before Christ and after Christ. Look, you and I may never get a chance to meet the King of England or the President of this country, but all of us will have an encounter with the King of Kings. Yeah, the idea of being face-to-face with God, it's a little intimidating. And guess what? It should be. Yeah, right? It should be. But that doesn't mean it needs to be a frightful experience. His Majesty and our lowliness... Already, it's already an awkward situation, right? So once we realize that the right response is worship and repentance, we'll find the forgiveness and the restoration that leads to this joyful service in God. But I think somehow along the way, some of that awe has been lost from an encounter with God. Some of us have forgotten what it feels like to be surrounded by God's might. And maybe, maybe we just need to be reminded, whether that's going outside and touching grass and you know, getting some fresh air. I know. Some of you feel attacked, right? Or hiking a mountain and getting a new view or whatever you got to do, right? Just taking a step of faith. Some of you just need to take a step of faith and find out just how big God will show up, right? That, that God looms large in our life. We need, we need to recapture what it means to behold God and to worship God for what he's worth, which is everything. And so my prayer as we wrap up today, my prayer is that you have an encounter with Jesus that drives you to your knees in worship and humility with God, only to find out that he's already there, ready to lift you up and to send you out as a new person, ready to do his will. 
Father, thank you for the word of God.